Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your patience and for your willingness to accommodate the uh, public housing hearing, which I think uh, needed additional space. So thank you very much for uh, all your time. I know that, that people have uh, uh, limits on their schedule, so uh, we will uh, keep this hearing moving briskly. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the New York City Council's General Welfare Committee. Uh, today we're holding a hearing to address preventative services in, uh, at ACS. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge other council members who have joined us, Council Member Brad Lander, seeing none others. Um, we, do, we do expect that we will have other members of the committee join us. There is a number of con, uh, conflicting either hearings or, uh, or meetings happening right now as well. Preventive services are an essential tool designed to prevent entries into foster care and stabilize families uh, involved in the child welfare system. We know that over the past decade, as the availability of preventive services has increased, the foster care census has significantly decreased without a subsequent increase in review, re repeated abuse cases. Uh, today, I would like to hear from ACS about the availability of preventive services, including a breakdown of the various evidence-based models available to families in New York City. I would also like to know whether there are any accountability measures in place, both existing or, or new, uh, whether the effectiveness of preventive services are being measured over time, whether clients are receiving preventive services are given the opportunity to provide meaningful feedback on how such services can be approved, and also the wraparound services that are associated with uh, particularly general preventive services, which um, constitute about half of the slots, or a little bit more than half the slots in the system. In addition to getting an update on the full array of preventive services provided by ACS, I'd also like to be sure that the public understands what preventive services are and how they can be accessed. I'd also like to discuss how these services can be improved. According to a policy brief by the Center for New York City Affairs, there's been a significant slowdown in the opening of new preventive services cases with the result that families may wait months to participate in programs that are required of them by family court judges. Uh, since October 2016, in the, in the last 20 months, shortly after Zamir Perkins' tragic death occurred, ACS has, has closed 18% fewer preventive services cases than they did in the 20 months from 20, October 2014 to May 2015. Uh, providers, therefore, have limited capacity and fewer new cases can be opened. Now, we know that uh, under Commissioner Hansel, uh, there has been historic investment in new preventive services uh, in uh, New York City, and uh, we're excited to uh, work with him on that. Um, and want to make sure that, uh, and as I understand now, that there are no uh, wait lists currently um, for any of the preventive services, or if there are, we'd like to hear about that and what can be done about that. Um, over the past 20 months, ACS has opened 13% fewer new preventive services cases than it did in, in those 20 months, October 14 to May 2016, according to the Center for New York City Affairs report. The Mayor's Management Report, otherwise known as the MMR, also appears to demonstrate that the number of children receiving, receiving preventive services is actually decreasing. According to the Fiscal 18 MMR, children who received child welfare preven prevention services during the year, the total annual figure, was 43,874 in FY18, which is lower than the FY15 total of 47,001. Today we need to have a better understanding of these figures and the long-term impact that they may have. Finally, I'd like to learn more about the new Division of Child and Family Well-Being and their efforts to assist families uh, well before maltreatment occurs. Uh, these efforts include the Family Enrichment Centers, which are designed to be storefront community-based resources, providing support and making referrals for families. Three of these centers opened this year, and I'd like to discuss how the progress is going. I'm glad to see uh, Deputy Commissioner Lorelei Vargas. Uh, and, uh, and how progress is being measured for this new model of primary prevent preventive services. Um, I think it's uh, vitally important that people are able to interact and receive services with New York City and ACS without um, the stigma of, of ACS as a, as a um, required interaction. Um, I think that that, uh, that, that is uh, essential in order to give families the support that they need when they need it. 
In addition to hearing from ACS, we want to he also want to hear from advocates and providers about the gaps in service that may exist as, and welcome any suggestions for improvement. I'd like to thank the council staff for their work today to prepare for today's hearing. Uh, council Aminta Kilowan, Policy Analyst Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, Finance Analyst Daniel Krupp, I'd also like to thank my Legislative Director Elizabeth Adams, Communications Director, Communication Director Edward Paulino, Chief of Staff Jonathan Boucher, and Constituent Liaison Deidre Cheatham. I'd also like to thank members of the administration who have come here to testify, Commissioner David Hansel and Deputy Commissioners Jacqueline Martin and Laura Lai Vargas. And with that, I will ask uh, Council of the Committee to, uh, to swear you in, if that's okay. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the, whole, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these council members here today and to answer honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Levin, Council Member Lander. Um, I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. And with me today, uh, to my right, are Dr. Jacqueline Martin, who is the Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Prevention Services. And to my left, Lorelai Vargas, who's Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I do have to say that I am very fortunate, and I think we are all very fortunate in New York City, to have two women of their caliber leading this very important area of our work. And we appreciate the opportunity to discuss it with you. Um, we at ACS recognize that providing families with the help that they need to overcome challenges, challenges that include trauma, poverty, isolation, mental health issues, domestic violence, among others, is critical to keeping children safe. Over the years, ACS has steadily increased the availability of evidence-based preventive programs that are shown to reduce rates of maltreatment and to improve overall child and family well-being. Last year, Casey Family Programs, a nationally recognized child welfare organization, noted that New York City is now at the forefront nationally in providing evidence-based prevention programs to support families. Under the recently enacted Federal Family First Prevention Services Act, states now have the option for the first time to utilize federal funding under Section 4E of the Social Security Act to support preventive services for families whose children would otherwise be candidates for foster care. Since this law took effect in February of this year, we at ACS have received increased interest from child welfare agencies across the country as well as the leadership of the Federal Children's Bureau in how ACS's evidence-based prevention programs could offer models for states and localities across the country. Our unprecedented investment in prevention services has continued to allow our agency to serve increased numbers of families in the community while reducing the number of children placed in foster care. Number of children in foster care in New York City is now under 8,500 a momentous shift from the nearly 50,000 children in care 25 years ago and nearly 17,000 a decade ago. And the decline in our foster care population has continued even as national foster care caseloads have increased since 2012, principally as a result of the opioid epidemic. ACS, is, ACS contracts with 54 nonprofit agencies who together with their staff deliver high quality services to thousands of New York City families every day. ACS provides extensive technical assistance and oversight to these providers to ensure high quality services and child safety. The investments we've made with the Council in our prevention providers beginning in the FY18 budget, including our model budget process that we described in our testimony in June, ensure that our providers can implement the best possible service models to support families and that they are appropriately compensated for doing so. As you know, the tremendous progress that we've made was threatened by severe proposed cuts to child welfare funding that were included in the governor's executive budget last January. Thankfully, the final state budget did not include these cuts. And I want to once again thank the council for your powerful advocacy on behalf of our city's children and families during those state budget negotiations. I also want to thank the children's advocacy community across the city who did extraordinary work to make sure that the state legislature understood the potential impact those cuts would have and persuaded legislators and the governor to maintain the state's commitment to our work. Because we believe so strongly in prevention, we launched our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing last fall, making ACS 
the first child welfare agency in the country to spearhead a primary prevention approach, which seeks to reach families proactively with services, with resources, and with educational messages that can support healthy children, families, and communities. Our ambitious vision, building on the success of our existing prevention programs, is to build the capacity to reach families before involvement with the child welfare system occurs through a range of direct service public education and community building strategies. Our new division has been in place for a year now and we're excited about the work we're doing and the potential to expand it in the future. So I will now turn over first to Deputy Commissioner Martin and then Deputy Commissioner Vargas to discuss our prevention programs in more detail. Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Martin, the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Prevention Services at ACS. Our goal in DPS is to help keep children safe and to ensure that every New York City child has the support of a strong family and a healthy community to help them succeed. We do this by partnering with families and providing access to high quality services that have real impact. New York City is one of the few jurisdictions in the country where families have access to a comprehensive, holistic, and fully funded continuum of services and supports to strengthen families and prevent entry into foster care. ACS funds over 200 programs delivered by 54 contract providers that support families throughout the city. Our contracted providers are located throughout the five boroughs and are fixtures in the communities they serve. The services they provide range from case management to high intensity evidence-based interventions for families with significant mental health or other challenges. The overall number of child welfare prevention slots has increased from 11,994 in fiscal year 2015 to 13,596 in fiscal year 2019. By the end of fiscal year 2019, ACS will have expanded its array of family support services for approximately 2,900 families. This includes nearly 1,700 slots for families to be served by our contracted prevention family support services and 1,000 additional families already receiving new specialized supportive services as their children return to them from foster care. As you know, Local Law 16 of 2018 requires ACS to provide training for prevention services caseworkers. The fiscal year 2018 budget includes funds so that prevention agencies can send staff to training. Providers can receive training at our Workforce Institute or use their own trainings approved by ACS to fulfill the training requirements. ACS has instituted a standard that all current prevention staff take six days of training each year. These include a mandated reporter e-learn program as well, as well as courses on motivational interviewing safety and risk, understanding and undoing implicit bias, and intimate partner violence. Direct service staff and prevention supervisors are required to take all of the above. Supervisors are also required to take a course on coaching. In addition, in fiscal year 2018, the ACS Workforce Institute developed an 11-day learning program for new preventive case planners in our provider agencies. This new program includes simulation opportunities and structured on-the-job experiences. During fiscal year 2018, 4,033 provider agency learners took courses through the Workforce Institute, including most frontline staff in prevention agencies. One of the important hallmarks of the New York City's prevention services system is that we offer a continuum of services that allows us to match a family to the services they need, both in terms of intensity and specialization. I'm going to describe the types of programs in our continuum. 
general prevention and family treatment programs. General prevention is our largest service model and serves families with children between the ages of birth to 18 years, as well as young people between the ages of 18 to 21 years who were formerly in foster care. General prevention services last a full year and are tailored to the individual needs of each family by including services such as case management, individual and family counseling, support groups for parents and youth, help in meeting children's developmental needs, referrals and help accessing benefits, education, prenatal care, substance abuse, mental health, and domestic violence counseling, as well as vocational services and early care and education services. Across the city, ACS funds more than 7,000 general prevention slots. Family Treatment and Rehabilitation Services, or FTR, are designed for higher risk families and include treatment for substance abuse and mental illness. FTR programs offer clinical diagnostic teams comprised of licensed therapists, credential alcohol substance abuse counselors or CASACs, case planners, psychologist consultants, psychiatric consultants, and other providers who work with families to develop treatment plans. Evidence-based practice. ACS's continuum of prevention services includes promising practice and evidence-based models, which have been proven effective through documented, rigorous scientific study. Evidence-based models require intensive staff training, and they require clinical and case practice to uh, adhere to strict fidelity standards. We lead the country in our implementation of evidence-based models, including family functional therapy, child-parent psychotherapy, and multi-systemic therapy. These programs enable us to serve a broader array of families experiencing complex challenges and address issues like mental health, substance use disorder, and trauma. Over the past three years, the Division of Prevention Services has been a forerunner in launching innovative new programs and approaches to continuously improve the way that we serve children and families. I'd like to share a few of our new programs with you. Court-ordered supervision. In expanding our continuum of prevention services, we have made a deliberate effort to bolster services for our higher needs families receiving court-ordered supervision or at immediate risk of court intervention. In the spring of 2018, ACS announced awards for 960 new prevention slots, including 480 in evidence-based programs. After implementation planning throughout the summer, within ACS and with the awarded provider agencies, programs began accepting referrals on October 1, 2018. The second phase of implementation is currently underway and involves preparing and training provider agency staff on providing informative testimony in family court regarding the family's progress. ACS and our provider agencies are working collaboratively to co-design the process and trainings required for this phase. With support from the National Implementation Research Network, phase three entails developing practice profiles to help clarify the roles of the prevention case planner and the ACS Family Service Unit Child Protective Specialist when both professionals are working with the same family. This phase involves interviews and focus groups with the ACS Division of Child Protection, our family court attorneys, and our prevention provider agencies. Group attachment-based intervention, or as we refer to it as GABI, in 2017, ACS launched GABI, uh, the GABI Initiative, which provides access to trauma-informed, intensive, attachment-focused therapy for our hardest-to-reach families, namely parents and very young children ages 0 to 3 who have experienced significant trauma, housing instability, mental illness, domestic violence, and other challenges. 
Gabby provides group settings where parents can connect with others experiencing similar challenges and seeks to improve children's development, decrease their experience to trauma and maltreatment, reduce parental stress, and boost parental social support and mental health. There are currently five Gabby drop-in sites located throughout the city in Manhattan, Queens, and Staten Island. Each have a Gabby site and two sites are located in the Bronx. We are planning to open a Brooklyn site in 2019, which will be co-located with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene at their Bedford-Stuyvesant Neighborhood Health Action Center. A safe way forward. Earlier today, ACS announced a safe way forward, a new prevention initiative launching this spring that will work with families experiencing domestic violence. This new program is the first of its kind in the country, as it will provide both prevention and clinical services to all members of families experiencing domestic violence, including the survivors, children, and the person causing harm. This model was developed through unprecedented research and collaboration. Our community-based strategies team conducted over 12 months of research, including literature reviews, interviews with over 100 experts across the country, and close collaboration with survivors, advocates, parents causing harm, and the mayor's office to end domestic, to end domestic and gender-based violence. This approach allevi uh, alleviates the voice of the fam elevates the voice of the families we serve and will ensure that every part of the program is an empowering experience for them. We strongly believe that families' voice must be central to our work. ACS will partner with two provider agencies to serve 130 families in the Bronx and Staten Island that are involved in court-ordered supervision and have been referred to prevention services. Earlier this year, our community-based strategies team was awarded the first ever Designing for Opportunity grant from the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity Services Design Studio. This competitive grant has enabled our team to work in partnership with designers using human-centered design tactics to better understand the family's journey through prevention services. Over the past several months, we have been interviewing ACS and provider staff, as well as families and advocates to understand their experience of ACS's prevention and will be co-designing system improvements with them to ensure that our services are accessible, family-driven, and meet their needs. This work will also help inform future procurements of prevention services. I will now turn to my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Lorelai Vargas, to discuss the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Lorelai Atali Vargas, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing at ACS. As Commissioner Hansel noted earlier, ACS has significantly enhanced our work in prevention services to provide supports for families before a need for intervention arises. The creation of the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing last fall brought our city to the forefront nationally for our commitment to primary prevention. CFWB aims to engage families before they ever reach the child welfare system with resources and services to help them prosper. We focus on the factors that contribute to family well-being, including health, education, employment, and culture and use place-based and population-based approaches to engage families and communities. We also exercise a two-generation approach to meeting the needs of families, meaning we are focused on engaging and providing supports to both parents and children, the entire family unit, because when parents thrive, their children can flourish. Research shows that adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, cause damage to the physical, social, and emotional development of children and are a critical public health issue. CFWB is working to address ACEs and build protective factors for resilience. We know that sharing knowledge on ACEs and building these protective factors will be effective in reducing child maltreatment 
and improving child development outcomes over time. Our objective is to educate communities about brain science and work closely with them to design culturally competent approaches to reduce and mitigate toxic stress in their neighborhoods with a long-term goal of healthier outcomes. In addition to family enrichment centers, which I'll discuss further, CFWB's scope includes ACS's community partnership programs, the Safe Sleep Initiative, the Medication Safety Campaign, Early Care and Education, and a new Office of Equity Strategies that works to identify strategies to reduce inequities, implicit bias, and other factors that contribute to disparate outcomes for the families and communities we serve. ACS's Family Enrichment Centers represent an innovative new model for providing comprehensive, community-focused support to families. The FEC model is family-centered, primary prevention strategy that's designed to reduce rates of child maltreatment and increase family stability and well-being. Everything about each center, from the name to the physical layout to the services offered, was co-developed with families in the community. The FECs are open to all families in their communities and provide a range of services that support healthy child development. Because the design of each center is community driven, they, they are an important vehicle for helping all children and families to thrive. Each family enrichment center mirrors the needs of the community and helps families locate and access the unique resources they need to succeed. We are proud to have launched three pilot family enrichment centers in 2018 in neighborhoods with high rates of child welfare system involvement. The first center opened in February in the Hunts Point Longwood neighborhood of the Bronx and is called Our Place, organizing to be united and resilient. Shortly thereafter, the Crib Community Resources in Brooklyn in East New York and Circle of Dreams in Highbridge opened their doors to the community. Our goal is to work alongside the community and bring them the resources they have identified to help each and every family thrive. By listening to communities and using data, we're able to leverage resources to support families with the eventual goal of lowering rates of involvement in the child welfare system. FECs are currently in the midst of a pilot period, and once the demonstration project is complete, our goal is to expand and procure for FECs to continue in these, high, in these and other high-need communities. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss some of the many ways ACS supports families in New York City through our continuum of prevention services. ACS is deeply committed to providing high quality programs and services to meet the needs of all families in the city. And we're grateful for the council's support in this mission. We look forward to further cultivating our partnership with you to carry out this important work. Thank you again for your time and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Hansel and Deputy Commissioners Martin and Vargas. Um, before I go to my questions, I want to acknowledge council members that were able to attend. Unfortunately, they had to run back to a, a budget meeting. Council members uh, Adams, Ayala, Salamanca, Gredenchik, and Reynoso. Uh, and they might come back for questions mm -hmm. as well. Great. Um, so I guess maybe we'll start uh, with the family enrichment centers um, and, then, and then maybe go backwards through, through the testimony. Um, so how, um, how, how is it going? How are the, uh, just empirically, how are the, the challenges I think at the outset of these were how do we uh, create uh, programs or places in communities that people would want to engage with, you know, even knowing that ACS is kind of uh, involved with it. Uh, how, how do we create, you know, how do we do that? And, and how, you know, how to kind of overcome some of those challenges. And obviously people will, will go if they feel that there's benefit to be had, you know, if, there's a, if, there's, um, if they're able to access resources that they may be in need of or searching for. Um, and yeah, how's, how's it going? 
thus far? It's going I mean, great. Okay. Um, so the FECs are well underway. They've been open now um, a little under a year. Mm -hmm. um, each FEC was co-designed with the community. That means that the community chose the name, the community was involved in the physical layout, and now the community is involved in identifying what services and supports they need. So we, we've really kind of turned the traditional model of how government interfaces with nonprofits and with communities, and even how philanthropy interfaces with communities on its head. Mm -hmm. We're not going in and saying, these communities need X, Y, and Z. We're asking the community what they need. Mm -hmm. And you know that's been a major shift. Um, they're going very well, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one, we have, you know, each of our, our family enrichment centers are on their way providing services um, and programs. Again, all of the services and programs have been identified by the community saying, we need this. So they're different at each location, mm -hmm. um, but they range from things like a domestic violence support group to mommy and me time. Um, so they, they vary. Um, in terms of the stigma, we were very intentional as we set these up that ACS's name, ACS's logo is nowhere to be found in these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, in part, it's to begin to draw the community in, to create and build trust with the community, um, and to develop a sense of safety with the community. We have, though, since had a lot of conversations um, with the community and with the staff at these centers about you know, what that means and um, what the community's response is. Because some people in the community ask, you know, why is this here and who's funding this? Right. Um, and the providers are very direct with them that ACS is, you know, funding this work. And the responses have varied from, you know, wow, we didn't know that ACS did this kind of work, which is something that we like to hear because we do a lot of this work and we've been doing a lot of this work. Um, you know, to, oh, you know, we're not really sure that we want to be engaged, but then they continue coming because they find that there is support there for them. Mm -hmm. um, I've personally spoken with community members, parents um, in these programs, and I think one of the most powerful things that I hear over and over again, regardless of which program um, the parent is connected to, is that the family enrichment centers have really helped to provide social connections for families who otherwise would not be connected with other people in their community. Mm -hmm. And we know that those connections are a critically important uh, protective factor. We know that relationships are a top mitigator of toxic stress and adversity. Mm -hmm. So that alone is telling us that we're doing something right in these, in these FECs. Um, as far as evaluation goes, we're in the process right now, just as in the spirit of the design of the Family Enrichment Center of co-designing with the community and evaluation. Um, you know, there were concerns around coming in and studying the community. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the community, we've been somewhat transparent with them that evaluation is a necessary piece of how we understand how they're working and, and how we begin to support, you know, and, and gather funds for further expansion. Um, and so they're on board with that and they are working with us to co-design an evaluation. Um, we've partnered with the University of Oregon through funding um, from the Robin Hood Foundation okay. uh, to do that work. So um, that's how they're, they're, they're going. <laughs> and you're working with, uh with not-for-profits as well, right? So there's enough profit partners in each of those, correct? That's correct, yes. And those are? Um, so Graham Wyndham, um, uh, oh gosh, mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry? Good yes, Good Shepherd, sorry, it's not just yeah, yeah. fresh in my right, mind. Right. So Graham Wyndham, Good Shepherd, Good Shepherd and um, uh, Children's Village slash Bridge Builders, um, which oh, is right. part of um, Children's Village. Right. And so, the, and so they're hiring the staff, like the structure of it is that they're hiring the staff and then the staff are participating in any, like are they engaging in any type of training akin to a preventive service? Yeah, so we've so. trained, so they, they have hired staff and we've trained the staff there um, on appreciative inquiry and using the parent cafe model. Mm -hmm. And the parent cafe model essentially engages leaders in the community to come in and builds and develops leaders in the community 
to lead conversations that are really structured through the protective factors. Um, and that is how we begin to kind of understand what the needs of the community are and what services and supports need to be provided through them. Are you, I mean, every, as a council member, and I'm sure every council member hears this, you know, one of the big challenges, you know, people's, people's challenges that they're encountering in day-to-day -day life might not fit neatly into uh, like the jurisdiction of a single council committee or a single agency's responsibility. Uh, often there's, you know, there may be housing challenges or employment challenges or education challenges that people are having. How are you engaging or how is this, how is this program or system going to be engaging with housing? I mean, it, you know, which is like, you know, one of the most vexing, I can tell you, super vexing challenges that, you know, that we encounter. Absolutely. Um, so. Um, so two things. One is that when families feel comfortable enough and they've, you know, the programs have developed the trust with the families that they can, they come in and they actually share those concerns, um, the providers and the staff there at these agencies will reach out to us and say, hey, we have a family that, you know, is in need of housing or there's a mom here who's confided in us that she's in a, in a difficult, you know, DV situation where can I access services and supports for her? So the staff are very good about reaching out to us when they don't know what exists. But the other piece is that we recently procured our um, community partnership programs, and they're gonna be coming online um, in January of 2019. There'll be 11 of them. But we were very intentional about including the FEC communities in the RFP so that we double up in our efforts in these three um, high need communities. And so part of the role, one of the lead roles of these community partnership programs is really about leveraging existing investments that we're already making, not we ACS, but we the city, sure. um, you know, and, and private funders um, around things like housing and mental health, um, health, education. And so we have spent um, the better part of the last three or four months beginning conversations with our partners at various sister agencies to identify in these communities what are the supports that exist mm -hmm. and how can the CPP serve to really connect the dots and create a two-generation continuum of support with those existing investments. Right. And that is going to be a complement to the work that happens in the FECs, but really connecting families to supports. Right, I mean, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not that familiar with each of these neighborhoods to speak definitively about it, but in a lot of neighborhoods you have settlement house type models where you, you do have multi-generational, two, three generation engagement with families, uh, seniors and uh, parents and, and, and children. Um, uh, and um, yeah, looking to see, I mean, I, I, one thing I would be wary of is kind of reluctance to do, um, people retreating into their own turf or into their own organization. So for example, like if, uh, if the Graham Wyndham um, provider is in a neighborhood, you know, is in the Lower East Side and Settlement House down there is, uh, is Henry Street Settlement House, um, that they're not seen as any way competitors but instead complementary and kind of working to, to leverage those resources that have existed for, you know, through state and city programs. Yeah, and that is baked in the design of the work that we're doing. I mean, we've been very intentional about, um, about engaging um, not only our sister agencies, but the providers. And mm. we are taking a collective impact approach. Um, so really engaging everybody that's there on the ground doing the work right. um, to connect resources. We have providers who, you know, aren't seeing the number of clients that they could be seeing if they were better connected with each other. And that's right. kind of the approach that we take in bringing them together. Right. If I right. could just add, uh, Chair, to what uh, Deputy Commissioner Marcus said, this is really an approach that pervades, I think, everything that we're doing at ACS. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, as, as I said in, in testimony, we realize that often the roots of what manifests as child welfare issues uh, can be attributed to poverty, to trauma, to housing instability, to educational issues, mm -hmm. mental health issues, health issues, and so on. And so the response to them has to be much broader 
than uh, the services that ACS offers directly. Mm -hmm. So through all of our preventive services, uh, the, the ones that Deputy Commissioner Vargas has described, our preventive programs, um, and the community-based services that we, through our preventive programs and through our child, child protective work, we connect families to, our goal is always to leverage the resources that exist in the communities that will help respond to the issues that families are dealing with in a way that will help address child welfare issues if those have occurred or help to forestall them if they haven't. Right. Um, so we are very attuned to that. You, you in your opening statement, mentioned uh, wraparound services, which I'm sure we'll come back to, and that's a great example of how we can complement what we are doing directly at ACS with services that already exist in the communities that can provide complementary support to families. Right, and having a, a, a structure in place, I mean, I can just tell you in my personal experience is like trying to find housing resources for constituents that come to me can be like an immensely frustrating experience for me as the chair of the committee, banging my head against the wall saying, how come this person can't receive a voucher or you know, what resources are available or how are they gonna find an apartment and going to home base and being told by home base that they can't serve the person and then going back to home base and then going back over to HRA and then going back to home base. And I, and I think that like making sure that there are structured linkages mm -hmm. uh, between the various types of resources, the Department of Health resources, uh, community, you know, community-based DOHMH or mental health as you said, mm -hmm. um, the, whether it's GED programs, um, we, we, I, we have a, a, a literacy initiative out of the council that does a lot of work on early child literacy. When you mentioned mommy and me programs, you know, having um, a, you know group, um, uh, you know, group reading. I mean, I just think of my my uh, uh, my wife Anne and my daughter Frances go to music class down the street. You know, having making sure that we're engaging with like you know having a, a, a music class for toddlers at, at programs. Like, I mean, I think that that's all beneficial and that. Um, you know that that my family can access, but um, but want to make sure that like every child in New York City has access to that. Absolutely, and that's the goal. Yeah. Um, okay, we might come back to some of those issues. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, well, how are I mean, how are families coming in? I mean, how are they are they being referred, or are they walking in off the street, or? It's a combination. Um, it's a combination. So um, there are events that take place that draw families in. Some families just walk in the street, walk in off the street and say, what is this place? I've never seen this place before. What do you do mm -hmm. here? Um, we're now at the, at the stage where families are telling other families in the community about it. So there's kind of family to family referral to come on in and see the space and spend some time there and get involved. So it's really kind of a broad range. And the staff, in the beginning, were doing a significant amount of outreach, in part, you know, participating with other providers that were in the community, you know, already kind of connected to families, and just kind of going out, talking with families, getting to know them, and letting them know that the Family Enrichment Center uh, was there. Um, how about schools? Are you involved in the elementary schools or the, or the early child, the, the, the pre-K programs, or what? Sure. Uh, so yeah, so those relationships exist in each of the respective communities and the staff at each of the family enrichment centers have been really good about, you know, developing those relationships. And in any of these cases, whether it's the schools or the child care centers or the neighborhood health action centers, you know, in any way that we can help to facilitate the connection, we absolutely do. Right. Health and hospitals. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Joni. Councilmember, do you have any questions? Um, okay, so uh, let's turn over to um, to preventive for a while. Um, so I think if we could take kind of a a, uh, a kind of big picture perspective on where things stand on on uh, preventive. Uh, <coughs> cases, new cases, and kind of what's happening, its relationship to the broader child welfare system um, over, the, over the last 20 months. Um, so if you've read the, the uh, Center for the City of New York report, kind of speaks to um, Center for New York City Affairs, sorry, that, that speaks to the um, kind of some of the dynamic shifts that have happened since since uh, since this time in 2016, mm -hmm. um, where we've seen uh, K 
caseloads increased significantly. Average caseloads have gone up to 14. Uh, this, this is a, the report was put out in July, so these are you know, on July's numbers. Um, uh, we've seen a, a really significant number of an increase in the number of cases where um, ACS is referring the case to for for a court intervention of some kind. So the case gets uh, there's a you know a. Uh, uh, not necessarily an emergency removal, but a, a referral to, to mm -hmm. the court system, basically to, 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 to put it before a judge mm -hmm. and have a judge. It, it, it kind of describes that process, and basically there's a, an, through an abundance of caution, um, engaging with, um, with the family court system, which is in turn causing a, a logjam effect at, um, at the family courts, which then, you know, is, is, is having potentially, you know, other, it, it, it makes it so that other cases that may be more, um, deserve more attention or should get more focus are kind of getting less time because there are more cases in front of our family court judges. Um, now we have not seen uh, a, an increase in the, obviously the number of, of um, foster care placements and we have not seen, I don't believe, an increase in the number of, um, of uh, court-ordered supervision, but we have seen then a, a, a decrease in the number of new cases, preventive cases being opened. Um, in kind of in those, in that, in that those, if they're, they're comparing, you know, if you look at the charts that they have, they're going, month to month and comparing it year over year so that they're not comparing June of one year to October of another year. They're comparing June to June, October to October. Um, how is this all kind of fitting together? Uh, and w I guess why, the first question of, uh, as it relates to preventive is why are, why are the, the number of new cases of preventive actually less than they were three years ago? Mm -hmm. Um, well, let me, uh, there were a lot in your question, a number of questions there. Big, so big picture let me, let me try to give sort of a, a broad answer, and then we can uh, zero in on specifics that are of interest to you. Um, and the time frame you're talking about is, is largely parallels my term as commissioner. I came in about 19, 20 months ago uh, in the wake of the fatalities in late, of, late 2016. And uh, after those fatalities, in the months after those fatalities, we saw, we did see a number of things happen in New York City. One is, uh, we saw a very significant spike in the number of reports of abuse or neglect that we received. And as you know, uh, those reports uh, go initially to the state hotline, which is formerly known as the state Cent central registry or the SCR. Uh, the state makes an initial determination whether to accept that report, and if they do, they refer it to us. And we are obligated to investigate every report that the state refers to us and make a determination of whether we believe that the allegation of that a child has been maltreated is, is substantiated or not. So there was a significant spike in those reports uh, in um, early 2017, and it has continued since then. And that has meant that the volume of reports that our Division of Child Protection has had to investigate has gone up. Mm -hmm. That did mean for a period of time that our average caseloads went up. Um, we have done a lot uh, about that issue. First, first of course, for foremost is hiring. Uh, we hired about 700 new child protective specialists last year. Uh, we are doing a lot to try to improve our retention rate among those specialists. We're doing a lot to improve the efficiency with which they do their work through providing them technology, uh, tools, improving things like transportation support so they can get out in the field faster, to expedite their investigations. Um, so we have been working uh, very aggressively to manage that very significant increase in reports with the, um, the workload that we have, the, wor the workforce that we have. And I'm happy to say that in uh, August of this year, August of 2018, a couple of months ago, we uh, had reached the lowest average caseload in our child protective division that we had had since prior to those facilities in, 20, in 2016. Our average case was down to something around uh, an average of nine cases per caseworker. It's gone up a little bit since then because there is some cyclical variation in reports. Um, but we are still well below the threshold that we use, which is 12, an average caseload of 12, which is what we consider to be a caseload that a child protective specialist can reasonably manage. So we have been below that uh, threshold for the last few months, and, and we continue to be. Um, 
With regard to preventive Sorry, service. Sir, that, Sorry. that peaked. Where did that peak? It peaked, uh, I believe it peaked in the early summer of this year. Um, okay. Again, typically there is a, a spike in the number of reports we receive in the sort of May-June period near the end of the school year because many of them are related to uh, educational reports that come in near the end of the school year. And then there's another peak usually around uh, this time of year as children go back to school and um, as schools begin to see attendance patterns and observe kids who are not coming to school on a regular basis, we tend to again sort of see an increase in, in reports at that time. So I think, I think uh, we peaked sort of in the late spring, early summer range. It's been coming down since then. Um, and we hit a low point in August, and we continue to be uh, well below the average of last year and, and, and below the uh, average of 12. With regard to preventive uh, services, you, you, you mentioned the issue of, of fewer um, new preventive cases um, opening. Uh, that is something, and actually I've discussed this previously with, with you and with the committee in, in prior hearings, including our, uh, our budget uh, hearings last year. Uh, when I became commissioner in March of last year, one of the things that I was very concerned to learn was that we were, uh, our rate of closing cases, uh, preventive cases, had slowed. And as a result of that, our rate of opening cases, because we have a limited, a, a finite number of slots. Um, and so it's very important for us to work with families to the point where they've achieved their objectives. And we think children are safe and we can, uh, we can safely move that family off preventive services so we can make that slot available to a new family whose, uh, whose needs are, are, uh, are more immediate. That process had slowed, and uh, I actually immediately began to work very closely with Dr. Martin and her team to understand why, because I was very concerned about it, and because I did know that we were at a point back in uh, early 2017 where we were not able to match families, families needing services with the appropriate services as quickly as we want to. So we did an analysis of that, and we discovered there were several things at the root of that. One, was, one, was, one part of it was internal to us, which was sort of business process. Uh, that there were things about our process of doing that referral and matching that were not as efficient as they could be. So we worked on that. A second part of it had to do with the fact that in response to the fatalities in, in late 2016, particularly the Zamir Perkins fatality, yeah. um, we implemented some changes in response to recommendations we got from Department of Investigation and, and others um, that um, slowed the process of closing cases, made it more difficult for us to close cases. And that had the entirely unintended but still significant consequence of making it more difficult for us to make slots available to families coming to the system. So we looked at how we could expedite the process of safely closing preventive cases when we thought that families had successfully completed their objectives in, in the service model. And the third is that uh, we found that many of our providers were unable to meet their contracted capacity because they could not staff, they could not maintain, attract and retain enough qualified case workers and case managers to serve the population that they were contracted to serve. And that was because we were not adequately compensating them to do that. And that, of course, led to the conversations we had in the budget process beginning last year in fiscal year 18 about what we needed to do to make sure that we were adequately compensating providers to provide the quality of services and to maintain the quality of staff that they needed to do that. And so with the support of the council, uh, we invested in some specific areas like increased training, increased conference facilitation, uh, increased participation in our quality assurance work, but we also initiated the model budget process, which we talked about at the hearing in, in June, which has enabled us, and that, that process is now pretty well done, I think virtually all of those contract amendments are now completed and registered. Mm -hmm. That has enabled our providers to uh, raise uh, salaries for their casework staff and their supervisory staff to levels that enable them to attract the caliber of staff they need, and in many cases have enabled them to reopen their intake systems so that they can increase the number of, of uh, families that they're serving. And that's been, just for the, for the record, that has been widely, um, uh, there's a consensus that that has gone well for providers. They've, there's been positive feedback from providers on, on the ACS model budget uh, process. So yeah, well, that's great to hear. Feedback it's, I've gotten. It's, 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 it's really feedback we've gotten. It's great to hear you've gotten as well. But what's most important is we've seen the impact we wanted, which is that providers are able to staff up, they're able to reopen intake, they're able to meet their contracted levels of service. So by focusing on all those things, there's some others, but those I think are the most important ones. Um, in the first six months of my tenure here, between March of 2017 and August, 
we were able to get to the point where we were, in the vast majority of cases, able to match families with services that they needed very quickly. And we have stayed in that place since then. Um, so I think some, some of the data that you're reading is probably over a period of time, doesn't necessarily re reflect where we are today. Um, with regard to quarter services that you mentioned, that is uh, an area we obviously have seen an increase in the number of court ordered sur supervision cases. I'm sorry, supervision and often those cases involve court ordered services. Um, we seek court supervision in situations where we believe that it is possible to keep a family together safely, it is possible to keep a child with uh, his or her parents or parent or caretakers, but only if the parent or parents participate in services to address the source of the risk to those children, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's uh, domestic violence, whether it's mental health or health issues. Um, we only believe that that family can remain together safely if the parent participates in services, and we're not certain that the parent will do that voluntarily. And those are the situations in which we seek from the family court an order directing the parents to participate in services. Very often, in the case of a domestic violence situation, it may be an order uh, to require that the person causing harm remain away from the family so that they're not jeopardizing either uh, adults or children in that, in that family situation. Um, but whatever it is, uh, it's, we seek that only when we think that uh, court oversight is necessary to ensure that parents participate in those services. Sometimes um, we, uh, we in, there are some situations in which we go to court requesting a removal and the court makes a decision that supervision is adequate. But in every case, uh, supervision is an alternative to removal of children, which is where it's safe and possible, an alternative that we prefer. Um, so it's, it's uh, an intervention that we think is appropriate in many situations, but we also only want to use it where it's absolutely necessary. Right, and what we've seen, I mean, in the, this report, you know, speaks to a certain kind of level of caution that has been a lasting consequence. This is a lasting consequence of the crisis surrounding Samir Perkins' death that the caseworker said is that frontline ACS staff are more inclined to recommend that the cases be taken to court rather than allowing families to do voluntary services. And you know, the, the, if there's, an in, you know, there's a 10% increase in the SCR uh, calls in the corresponding time and a 54% increase in the, uh, in the instances of ACS referring the matter to family court. In other, in other words, not, not handling the issue uh, you know, through voluntary services. Um, it just, it, it, obviously it has an impact on, on the caseload and management at our family courts, which are obviously over, overburdened anyway, um, but kind of, you know, there, if, if a family, I mean, it, it's, it talks to family court judges booking two, three cases in the same half hour slot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily, I mean, look, judges are, are, we need family court judges uh, to be to be there to be able to make difficult decisions. But I'm not sure that if they have two or three cases in a f half hour slot, whether they're going to be necessarily any more informed than a caseworker that's been working on a uh, or, or supervisor that have been working on a case for uh, for, for for a month, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I just I'm I'm, I'm no, concerned no, about that it. as yeah, a kind of yeah. ongoing I, consequence of of. Of, of these, these I cases. appreciate those concerns. We, those are, of course, also issues for our family court legal services attorneys that are taking those cases to court, as well as our child protective specialists uh, that uh, go to court to testify as to why we believe supervision is necessary. So yeah. it's something that we, we monitor closely. I guess I, two things I would say is one is I think it is important to look at those numbers in relationship to, as, as you uh, acknowledged, uh, Mr. Chairman, that. Uh, the, our foster care case was going down significantly. Yes, so, right. yes, we have more cases under supervision, but we have fewer cases going to foster care, which I think is the right what direction. we prefer to see. Yes. Um, the other thing I, I have to say, we do work very closely with the family court. I meet on a regular basis with uh, Jeanette Ruiz, who is the chief administrative judge of the court, to talk about ways that we can work together to make the system work more eff efficiently. Um, but I will say that I, you know, we need to make our judgments based on what we think is necessary to keep children safe. Right. Um, and I, I would be concerned if we were making judgments based on the capacity of the court system rather than what's yes. necessary for children's of, safety. Absolutely, I agree. I have, uh, Councilmember Joe Nye has uh, a question or two that he would like to ask. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Good to see you again, Commissioner. Good to see you. What are the total number of investigations that took place in 2017? 
in 2007, 2017, I believe it was about 55,000. Do we have the exact number? Yeah, sorry, 15? 59,812. How many of those were for abuse or neglect? Do you have a breakdown? Uh, yes, we do. Here we go. Um, and typically, the majority are for, are for neglect. So, um, do I have them broken up? Say here. These are broken up between indicated and unfounded. So, I'm going to have to. <laughs> I have the answer. Get these numbers for you. Um, we can get you the exact. I'm, I'm looking uh, on. Roughly speaking, approximately. This is why I didn't bring here. But, but they say the vast majority are neglect. Um, there of, of the total fifty nine. I'm sorry. Well, this is, has the English. Okay. I'm sorry. Eighty seven point five percent of those were neglect only. Twelve point five percent were either abuse only or were a combination of abuse and neglect. How many of those are substantiated or unsubstantiated? Yeah, typically about 40% of our investigations result in a substantiated, in uh, 2017, 39.8% of our total investigations were substantiated. So about, that, about 23,805 investigations. And of the 60% of the s roughly 60,000 that you close out as unsubstantiated, mm -hmm. do you have investigations that take on uh, take place at a later date as to reopen an investigation? Do you have recidivism in that sense? We w do that if there is a new report. Uh, if, we, if we complete a report on, uh, an investigation on a report and we determine it's unfounded, we close that investigation. However, if there is a subsequent report involving that child or those children or those parents, that history is part of what we consider in doing a new, a new investigation on a new report. Do we have any idea how many cases are reinvestigated after they've been closed? Because there's a subsequent uh, report on that family? Well, we can, I don't, we don't have that handy, we can get that information to you. I think that would be an important statistic as we understand the trends and uh, sure. are we closing cases properly um, and are they being reopened later on and there is a found of abuse or neglect, I think would be very telling um, as to how we're how far the investigations are taking place. And an average investigation is what period of time? Um, invest, we have a 60-day period to complete investigations. Um, they typically take almost that complete period of time. Sometimes they take a short amount of time, but uh, typically the investigative period is 60 days. How many visits uh, to a family's home? It depends on the nature of the allegation and what we learn. Uh, we always make, we're required, and we do make uh, an initial uh, visit to a home within 24 or 48 hours, depending on the severity of the allegations, uh, and um, see the children within that period of time. Uh, we then do, in addition to whatever additional home visits are required, we do contacts with collaterals who may have information, which could be school personnel, could be neighbors, could be medical personnel, could be uh, you know, therapists or, or other providers who are working with the child or working with the family, uh, could be uh, other relatives, um, we, in addition to researching whatever history might exist with regard to that family, um, we uh, collect information from a number of other city databases uh, that might be relevant in terms of that family's utilization of other kinds of services. Uh, we do a review of any uh, criminal history related to that family, domestic violence history related to that family. So the investigative process is very extensive. Um, uh, but in terms of your immediate question, how often do we visit the home, that depends upon uh, the nature of the allegation and how often we need to go to, um, uh, to make a determination of whether to substantiate the report. If we do substantiate it and we make a decision that continued involvement is necessary, and if, for example, if uh, a, a case moves to court-ordered supervision, as we talked about, uh, we then remain uh, involved with that family and visit at least every two weeks, sometimes more frequently than that, to make sure that whatever risk issues we're concerned about are uh, maintained at a level that does not pose a safety concern for children. That's when they're substantiated, but when they're not, and my concern is how many visits are really made to a home to, that can be telling of the neglect or the potential for abuse. Yeah. And that's not a formula that 
it really it depends on the nature and the severity of the allegations, and it depends on uh, you know. There, as I said, there are a number of ways in which we have, we have to collect information to make the determination of whether we think there's a credible basis for the abuse or neglect allegation. Um, and some of that certainly comes from observing the home, talking with the parents, and meeting the child. Some of it comes from other sources as well. Is it safe to say that one visit is uh, not the norm? Yes. So there are several home visits that are made during a 60-day period. Yes, usually there are multiple interactions with the family um, and with the children. Actual well, interactions is one thing. I'm, I'm referring to unscheduled, unannounced visits to the home. Again, I think I have to say, let me talk, I consult with my experts here, but I think, it, again, it depends because sometimes there are reasons why we want to um, uh, see the children away from the home because we want to make sure that the children are not being coached by parents about what they're saying. We sometimes meet with children in the school or in other settings. Um, in the case of very serious allegations, um, uh, allegations of, for example, physical abuse or sexual abuse, we actually have protocols uh, for interviewing children in child advocacy centers and, and places like that where we can really uh, do the best possible job of, of getting to the bottom of what may in fact have happened. So again, there's a range of different ways in which we would interact with the children, interact with the family, depending upon the nature of the report that we're investigating. I, I guess my real concern is that we're not closing cases um, prematurely without doing a full investigation and um, nothing can be more revealing than home inspections where the alleged abuse or neglect is actually taking place. Uh, and to a trained eye, uh, several visits to a home uh, and interviewing the family members can be very revealing. So I'm just trying to get a better understanding how we investigate, how we make these home visits, and at what point do we really feel comfortable in determining whether they're, it's substantiated or not. If you could, uh, sorry, uh, just right. uh, say your name for the record, please. Natalie Marks, uh, Associate Commissioner for the Division of Child Protection. So our standards are the same, whether the cases are unfounded or indicated. We would make at least biweekly visits during the duration of when the case is open. And as the commissioner stated, under certain circumstances, it would be much more frequently. For example, there's children under one, or we begin to have serious concerns for the family. We will make visits. We also have the ability to send our emergency children's services on nights and weekends if we suspect something is going on. So, you know, again, it's, it's based on a holistic assessment of the family. So walk me through this, please. I have a better sure. understanding. Obviously, from the obvious, uh, you'll walk in unannounced, you'll make an inspection, you'll see if there's adequate food or nutrition for the children, right? You'll look for, uh, I'm sure, uh, telling signs of physical abuse, yes. uh, which will determine the next step. Could you elaborate a little bit? Sure, so when we come in, you know, initially um, during our required 24, 48 hour home visit, we must make an assessment of the home, so that includes food, and includes adequate bedding. Um, we have to determine who resides in the home. Um, we would ask for identification so that we can conduct proper clearances. We interview children and um, all family members separately um, whenever possible. Uh, and we look for obvious signs of abuse, you know, uh, bruises, marks, uh, if there's lack of food, you know, those are things that are, are red flags for us. Um, and oftentimes we will, you know, if we see something, we make a decision about safety and risk at every single visit. So there are times, you know, in the initial visit we see something that's very serious and we take action um, or we safety plan with the family depending on the circumstances. Um, and then that visit will determine next steps. And those next steps, are, please uh, remind me, how many visits are normally made bi-weekly, so a 60-day investigation leads so to So at what? minimum, we have to make visits bi-weekly while the case is open. So every two weeks, we have to see that family. So if it's open for 60 days, then we would see the family, you know, at least four times. And that's in every case. That's the bare minimum. Bi-weekly, but we do close some cases um, 
not many, but some cases less than 60 days. So however long it's open, so if it's open for 30 days, we will see the family at least twice. If it's open for 60 days, we would see the family at least four times. Cases that are closed, does anyone have any idea of the percentage that are reopened, they're found unsubstantiated, a later complaint requires another investigation, same protocol within 48 hours? Yes. Uh, how, do we have an idea of what percentage of the 60,000 cases? I don't have that number, but we can get it for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Joni. Um, so, I'm going to cover a few topics here. Um, let's see. The, the first topic I'd like to talk about a little bit, and it's being followed up on Councilor Joni's line, line of questions. Um, so, the, so the, the vast majority of, of cases that are called into SCR and cases that are indicated um, involve, uh, involve neglect. Um, as you're aware, uh, uh, just the uh, um, last couple of weeks, a um, uh, report came out uh, identifying over 100,000 New York City school students who meet the definition of homeless, according to McKinney-Vento, I think it was 100 and, over 110,000. Um, and um, housing instability, as, as I referenced before, has become a, an enormous factor um, in, in New York City, much worse than it was 10 years ago, much worse. I mean, we're on a, we're on a whole different level these days in terms of housing instability, and that means children are doubled up. It means children are just in, in unstable housing environments, so rent is in arrears, parents are stressed out, uh, or it means families are in shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, families might be in shelter due to domestic violence. Um, and so that's the HRA DV system. That's also the DHS system, family DHS system, where the people, there's no more room in, in the HRA DV system, and families are in a, in the DHS system due to domestic violence circumstances. Um, one alarming piece of data that I think is for everybody to be concerned about is the, uh, the, the, the percentage of children that are, or families that are placed in the DHS system who are placed according to their youngest child's, in the same borough as their youngest child's school of attendance, which um, uh, four or five years ago was uh, at um, uh, 80, over 80 percent and has gone down to around 50% and hovers around 50% to this day. Um, how, when, when we're examining, for this goes for CPS and this then goes for preventive case workers and supervisors, um, how are we exploring housing instability and other, and other measures of poverty as, as being, is causing circumstances that might that might lead to somebody calling an SCR complaint on somebody, or an indication, or not an indication, but a guide guidance towards voluntary preventive services. How I mean, how and and then and then as a follow up to that question, what what are we then doing about it if somebody's in so you know if somebody's in a general preventive program? Mm -hmm. How are, they, how are we helping them with housing instability, which is, you know, really difficult stuff to deal with, just because the city doesn't really have a lot of resources to deal with it, frankly. So, let alone ACS, but I mean, like, the city itself doesn't bring a lot to bear. No, those are very, very important questions, and those are things that we spend a lot of time thinking about, both uh, ourselves within ACS, but also working very closely um, with uh, both the DHS and the HRA sides of, of the Department of Social Services um, because we do believe, we know that there are a large number of families who are involved in both the shelter system and uh, in the child welfare system and so we have a responsibility to work as closely as we can to make sure we're addressing all of the issues that those families are dealing with. Um, we, uh, early last year, we, and I have talked about this previously as well, we entered into a new memorandum of understanding with um, 
Department of Homeless Services, uh, NACS, um, which enabled us to do a number of things. It enabled us to share data with them uh, more uh, robustly than we had previously so that we can, um, w again, obviously subject to, to legal constraints, but making sure that we can look at both the data we have about families and the child welfare issues and the information that we collect in the course of our child welfare investigations over our preventive services and the information that the uh, Department of Homeless Services has to provide holistic services and holistic ca case management for those families. Um, and it also has allowed us, our staff and uh, DHS case managers, mostly through their providers that run the shelters, um, also to work together more closely and to exchange information that enables us to serve families better and them to serve families better. So for example, uh, we are now getting um, more real-time information from DHS when families are moved from one shelter to another because, which does happen for some of the reasons you're saying, and, and that decision is a decision we have no involvement in but when it does happen, we need to know because, of course, it's important for us to remain engaged with that family, whether they're under investigation, whether they're receiving preventive services, wherever they are in our system, we want to make sure that we're following them um, so that they can continue to receive the services that they are receiving through, uh, through ACS. And we also want to make sure that families who are in DHS uh, temporary housing are still able to receive and eligible for all the same services they would receive in the community. So under the MOU, for example, uh, all families in DHS shelter receive counseling about uh, unsafe sleep practices, which is important to us for all the families we work with, and um, information and access to uh, early learn programs and other early education programs. So we're bring, making sure that we bring ACS services, proactive services, into uh, the shelters and reach families that are there. On the preventive side, um, and I, let me also mention, we also have had since last year uh, a team of child protective specialists, an, an ACS team, co-located physically at the path so that we can make sure that we're advocating for our families, and we do aggressively advocate for families that we're involved with at the path uh, to do everything we can to support their establishing eligibility uh, for shelter if they need that, and to the extent that we can assist with that based on information we know from our interaction with them, we will do that, but also to make sure that we get information through the path quickly that we can then convey back to child protective teams around the city that are working with those families. In the area of preventive, um, we actually have been working with and have initiated a couple of pilot programs um, with DHS and HRA that we are very excited about, and I think actually Commissioner Banks and his team are very excited about as well, that go right to your, your question about what can we do in, in our preventive work to help families that are dealing with housing instability. Um, uh, there are two of them, and, and uh, Dr. Martin can talk in more detail if you'd like to hear about them, but uh, we are, uh, we have worked closely with uh, really the HRA side to make sure that through our, prevent and we've piloted this in a part of the city, actually we're piloting it in Brooklyn um, and hoping eventually to uh, scale it across the city, but to work with families who are receiving preventive services to identify housing instability, to basically screen for housing instability, make sure that those families are referred to home base so that they can get the advantage of home-based services to avoid actually becoming homelessness and entering the shelter system um, on the front end. And on the back end, we are working with families that are receiving preventive services from ACS and are in the commercial hotel component of the shelter system to help them get rehoused and get out of the shelter system altogether. I think we all agree that commercial hotels are not a place we want families to be, certainly not a place we want the families we're working with to be, and so we have piloted uh, an initiative with Department of Homeless Services to identify those families who are in commercial hotels who are receiving preventive services from us and to work aggressively with them to help them use the subsidies that are available to them to get rehoused and get out of the commercial hotel part of that system. Um, so those are a couple examples of things that we're doing that we're very excited about because we do believe that an, an essential part of our preventive interaction with families needs to be around housing instability and homelessness where that's a reality those families are dealing with. Why just the hotels? Why not um, tier two shelters and, um, and remaining cluster sites that still, still exist? Well, I'll let Dr. Martin sort of talk. She really has been much more engaged in the details of working this out, but I think uh, fundamentally it's because we wanted to start this as a pilot uh, on a small scale to see, establish basically proof of concept yeah. and then expand both geographically and potentially Broad, more broadly across the system, but let me ask Dr. Martin to speak to that. And yeah. just one thing before, before you begin, Dr. Martin, that I, I, 
I can't, uh, it's hard to express my frustration trying to find, trying to get, help somebody who is in shelter either get a voucher or when they get a voucher find an apartment. People, I talk to people that have a voucher in hand for two years and can't find an apartment because the vouchers are like, you need a two bedroom apartment, two bedroom voucher is like $1,500. And it's just hard to find a two bedroom for $1,500. And so on the other side of, the, of this committee's work, you know, trying to advocate for an increase in the voucher limits, but I can just, I mean, it, nothing makes me more frustrated in my entire work than trying to find somebody, help somebody find an apartment and, it, and getting turned away frankly, sometimes by home base staff, sometimes by DSS staff. So just, just want to preface this with like, I get really frustrated with this stuff. So. And to that point, I mean, we understand that. It's an experience we hear a lot from families we work with. That's obviously a little bit outside of our jurisdiction. Right. But what we do want to do is make sure that we're helping the families we're working with utilize the resources that they do have um, to get out of the system. And sometimes, you know, through our prevention services, we can help them with that search process um, so that we can, you know, maybe expand on their capacity to use the vouchers to find the, the housing that they need. But let me let Dr. Martin. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Martin. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think, you know, we definitely share uh, those concerns. And so the Division of Prevention Services, our commitment is really to ensuring that our prevention providers have the support that they need to help the families that they are working with. And so we have approached that through the collaboration with both DHS as well as HRA. And so um, to elaborate on the pilots that the commissioner has been referencing, um, we believe that we are seeing some very positive outcomes uh, for those families. Uh, for example, um, for the families in commercial hotels, we were uh, working very closely in collaboration with um, the DHS providers, able to rehouse um, approximately uh, 31 families in this past year and rehouse them safely. So our efforts are really about uh, collaboration, having the family, uh, you know, also as a part of this conversation and ensuring that we are getting them um, using whatever financial resources that they have to get them rehoused. On the, on the HRA side, which I think is uh, also pretty exciting, yeah. um, we were able to uh, pilot a screening tool, I think, and although we are in Brooklyn, what we were able to do is to actually screen over 2,000 families to see um, whether or not they were at risk of housing um, instability. And so we think that attract, um, addressing this from both ends, if you would, uh, you know, our efforts to prevent families from going into shelter, as well as our efforts to, um, you know, expedite their discharge. Um, what about things like just, um, you know, necessities? So family is maybe in shelter, maybe in insecure housing, um, and, and is receiving preventive services. If they're in need, uh, say, say they get an apartment, but they don't have furniture, they don't have, you know, they're, they're just, maybe they're not able to buy enough food. I mean, honestly, SNAP benefits, some people, I know just people that are receiving $22 a month in SNAP benefits. So, you know, not, not nearly enough to, to fill the fridge. Um, how, if someone's in a general preventive slot, how, how are we making sure that those basic needs are met? Sure, thank you for raising that uh, because this really is the work that we do to ensure that families who have benefits keep those benefits, that there's not an interruption to those benefits. We work very closely with HRA, but we also, um, and I'm excited to tell you about another uh, pilot that, you know, ongoing work, I wouldn't even call that a pilot. We meet with HRA every two months to actually look at uh, families who are involved in child welfare and also receiving benefits through HRA. And our goal is to ensure that those benefits 
are not disrupted, and that if there are um, uh, sanctions against those benefits, that we are working closely with our providers to ensure that the families uh, cooperate with HRA to get those sanctions lifted or reduced. So our goal is to ensure that the families have the, have the, the resources that they need. Um, prevention agencies can also assist families uh, with accessing these, um, the, the, as you mentioned, for example, furniture. So one of the services and the resources that we have within a ACS is our day program, where when um, either doing an investigation or when prevention services is involved, if we see that a family needs uh, furniture or beds or cribs, whatever the needs are, we are able to provide those uh, quite expeditiously so that the families don't have to wait. Okay. Um, I mean, th there's a... Uh, there's a bigger question here, which is, are families either getting involved in a neglect case or either voluntarily or being mandated preventive services where the root issue is purely economic? The root issue is that, they, that there's just not, that there's, there's not enough money. I mean, I, I, will, I will tell you, I mean, like, I've, again, I, nothing has frustrated me more than working on individual cases. And I get told that somebody doesn't, can't receive, gets $22 a month and in SNAP benefits and doesn't re, can't receive um, PA because they're receiving $750 a month in disability. And that's it, $750 a month total. That's their, that's their monthly budget to be able to, and so, I, I mean, are, I guess my, my, my question is like, if we take a big step back, are we examining this all through the lens of, this is, this is about poverty and it's about economics more than anything else. It's about, it's just about, uh, it's about, it's an economic issue, not a, not necessarily a child welfare issue. Yeah. So this is a, a, a difficult issue for us. I think it's a difficult issue for all child welfare agencies, a difficult issue for us. Is, is, I mean, we know that economic inequality is at the root of many, many of the evils in, uh, in our society. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a reality we have to acknowledge. Um, what, we, what we try to do, and I think this is what Dr. Martin said, and this is not just true in our preventive services. This is also equally true within our Division of Child Protection, when a family is still in the investigative process, even at that stage, from the very beginning of our involvement with a family, if we see that a parent is, having, is struggling to meet the needs of their child because of economic issues, because of lack of tangible things like cribs, beds, refrigerators, food, things like that, um, we will work with them um, to help maintain benefits, as Dr. Martin said, to provide the tangible things that they need, to help that parent provide the support that their children need. Um, and that, that's, a, a, from our perspective, a critical part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and if we, so, for example, you know, when we um, launched this past summer our uh, CPS appreciation campaign publicly, that was one of the themes that we thought it was very important for us to try to project out to the city, which is that uh, a critical part of the work of our child protective specialists is to help parents meet the needs of their children and their families and also um, get the, you know, the resources they need, whether it's uh, education, whether it's childcare, whether it's jobs, that will enable them to support their children. So um, throughout the course of our involvement with the family, whether it's protective or preventive or even pre through uh, you know, our primary prevention work, that is a core part of what we do. Having said that, our fundamental responsibility is to protect children and keep children safe. And neglect can be as dangerous to children as abuse. Medical neglect, not treating a child's uh, serious medical issues, can be a, a very serious risk to children. Not providing for a child's nutritional needs can be a very serious risk. So we do have to make sure, ultimately, that, that children are uh, not being endangered by the situations in which they live. But our goal is to do that by supporting families, working with parents, helping parents access benefits, services, financial, concrete, whatever they may be, so that they can address whatever economic challenges they're facing and, and proactively care for their children when, whenever that's possible for them to do that. Um, 
May yes, I just add to what the commissioner has said? Uh, so I just first want to say that you are definitely speaking to my heart. Um, I have been doing this work for 30 years, and at the heart of what we see um, in families engaged with child welfare is exactly that issue, right? And so our intent, and I don't think that we would ever um, leave those needs unmet, uh, but there has been challenges along the way in terms of how we can be more responsive. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will have an opportunity as we uh, redesign our services um, to look more at uh, economic mobility opportunities as with the family enrichment centers. I know that that's a core of um, the service that they will offer to families. And our intent is to have that as a value throughout all of our child welfare services. And so we definitely want to uh, be innovative and cut an edge in terms of how we um, respond to just these needs. And making sure that that and I appreciate, I, I think that that's exactly, I mean, I, you're speaking to my heart. Um, <laughs> but uh, making sure also that that is, that that message is getting down to the case, the preventive caseworker who may be 26 years old and, you know, not long out of college and is now earning more than they used to earn, but, but, um, but is, is still, maybe doesn't have that breadth of experience necessarily to, to, to put all of those pieces together uh, on their own, but so that that is part of the core message is, hey, you're walking into a situation where somebody might be catching a, a neglect case that is purely because of their economics. So how do we work through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, that's, I think, a, a, an important message that has to get down to that, to the level of that, of the, of the case worker who's, you know, not long out of college and is, has a large caseload and, um, you know, and it doesn't want to make a mistake. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that's why uh, the ability that the agencies now have, first of all, to hire higher caliber staff, uh, the training requirements that we are now able to put in place because we are now able to fund them for that, to make sure that they're getting co core training around the way we want them to engage with, with parents and with families. Um, all those things we hope will help to move in the direction that you're describing. Okay. And I realize that we're, we're, it's a little past three, so we'll try to, try to wrap up our questions. Um, is there like a, a preventive, uh, preventive services client bill of rights? That, that, or is that something that you've considered of kind of, you have a right, you know, if it's a voluntary thing, you actually you have a right to say no. Because there's a, maybe a concern that maybe they feel like if they don't engage in preventive services that they might, that they, you know, they, they might, get reported again, or there, you know, there's a, it's, it's really, uh, I think, traumatic in any circumstance to get a call from ACS, right? If ACS shows up on your door, I don't care who you are, you, that is a scary situation, and trying to make, extricate yourself from that situation, you know, you don't want to do anything wrong, just, you know, you don't want to make a mistake, you don't want to lose your child, um, and is there, is there kind of a thought towards you know, kind of affirmative rights for for people receiving voluntary preventive services. So, uh, under the the state uh, regulations, <laughs> all families that we're offering prevention services to must be informed of um, their rights and. Um, and know their rights, and so that's a part of the application uh, for um, prevention services. But I also want to say that, you know, to your point about how, uh, you know, our uh, case planners and our frontline staff at the prevention agencies interface with families to just really help them to understand the nature of the services that they are participating in. On two levels, I want to say that our prevention agencies have been um, steady uh, uh, agencies in the communities where they are. They are they serve families not only through child welfare services but through other uh, services as well, um, and they are also able to engage families or assess families that need prevention services without an investigation, right? So those are our pure uh, voluntary prevention families, if you would, the walk-ins that come in seeking help for other um, interventions. 
Uh, but we also have um, worked very closely with our prevention agencies through uh, the trainings that are offered at the Workforce Institute. So um, all new prevention um, workers are expected to participate in at least 11 hours of onboarded training. And some of the things that they get to uh, certainly, and, and that training also includes some simulation, as I said before. So it's sort of the, this is the classroom, but then there is the reality of when you are working with a family. Um, and so we are able to actually begin to work with those um, uh, case planners or new to child welfare. We certainly want them uh, to be committed to this work and supported in the work. So we think that training is um, one key and certainly for the supervisors, not only training, but also coaching to ensure that they're then also supporting the case planners as they engage in this, what we know as is very difficult um, and challenging work. Um, and so, uh, okay, that's maybe something we can continue to talk about how, how that information is conveyed, you know, whether somebody's getting a pamphlet when they, First, at the first visit or something like that, or you know, ways to make sure that people know, you know, what their what their rights yeah, are. Yeah, certainly. Um, and then I, I'm going to ask just a few questions about about data. Um, but before that, I just want to ask one more about just service provision. And then I don't think I'm, we're going to have time to really get into the the various uh, diverse um, uh, evidence-based models that. So that, that are, but I'm, I, that's a, a long-term uh, subject matter that I would, I, I would be very interested in knowing, um, you know, how we're comparing evidence-based to general preventive and how we're determining, I mean, at a certain point, is it worth the investment in general preventive? I know it's, it's less expensive per slot than, 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 uh, than uh, evidence-based, but is it, is it worth investing in general preventive when we have so many different models? And I'm sure that there are models of evidence base that we actually, I mean, of, I think we have like something like uh, 15 different models, but I'm sure there are more out there that we could, you know, f we could bring on if we, you know, and I'm assuming over the next several years there will be new models developed. Um, before we get there, and maybe you could speak a little bit to that, but before we get there, in general preventive, do we, do families have access to counseling, um, you know, therapy, licensed clinical social workers that can help them talk through, you know, group sessions, things that, that you know, just kind of this kind of mental health services that, um, that uh, could probably help with a lot of issues people are dealing with. So uh, I think, you know, our intent in prevention services certainly is to match families with the most, um, uh, you know, with the service that's going to meet their needs, right? And so some families uh, do need a short-term uh, evidence-informed intervention, very focused on the therapeutic. Uh, it all depends on what those needs are. So, for example, the family might be struggling with, uh, you know, raising adolescents or a teenager, right? And so we have evidence-based models in our system to uh, uh, help a family really navigate that. We also have evidence-based models that are uh, really proven to work very effectively with families who are parenting uh, zero to three-year-olds, but they've had some uh, traumatic experiences or exposure to, uh, you know, traumatic experiences. So, for example, child-parent psychotherapy is a model that we have um, in our system. And so families come to us with all varying needs. And our general prevention program really has been the program that sort of captures uh, the most of the families in the net. They're in crisis. Um, and certainly that may be the reason why they've become known to child welfare um, or they just have, uh, you know, sort of case management needs. Uh, it may be that they're uh, 
you know, at risk of losing their housing or they're, they've gotten notification that, um, you know, they, they have an eviction notice, mm -hmm. for example. So all ver various types of, of issues. It very well also might be that they're facing, um, you know, or they've been exposed or have a domestic violence situation. And they, they get referred to general prevention. Um, it is our expectation that no matter which program model you're engaging in, that all safety of the children becomes paramount. So that's a non-negotiable for us, which includes the, the assessments. Mm -hmm. But also in general prevention, they can have and do have access to uh, case casework counseling to meet their needs. Um, when an agency is unable to provide the level of service that that family needs, for example, if they need mental health services, then that agency will refer them to a mental health um, you know, uh, program to meet those needs. So part of the work of the, the general prevention agencies is to be con assess what that family needs and then link them to the service that they need or refer them to the service that they need. Um, can somebody can somebody say that they're originally enrolled in a general preventive and it becomes clear that that they might benefit from an evidence-based model and there's a slot available? Is that something that people can can uh, at the through a referral from their case planner, case manager go towards go to a, a general preventive? Yes. Um, so I mean, go to an evidence-based. I'm sorry. From from general, general prevention to evidence-based. Yeah. Evidence -based. yeah. I think the the. They definitely can. Um, the way that we are structured in our continuum, we want families to have access to the service that they need. Okay. And so our in, uh, the way that we support agencies through that and in working with families would be that they are able to, uh, you know, uh, have an elevated risk conference if that's the need with the family at the table and then make a decision about which model might be beneficial. Uh, but I think you also know that one of the things that we have done uh, at ACS is to uh, bring Gabby group attachment-based intervention yeah. um, to ex especially to serve families who are in our general prevention and our family treatment and rehabilitation program. And how's Gabby available? Is it, is it people have to ask for it or is it made readily available to anybody that Yes, I think we, our expectation is that the case planners would discuss this service entity with the, with the family and or um, during the investigation if CPS can also uh, talk to the family about Gabby, but generally we rely on that case planner or CPS worker to be able to talk to the family about the service. Um, so any family in GP that serves children or that have children zero to three years old uh, can be a Gabby uh, family. Okay. Um, and how long has Gabby been in, in existence in New York City? Um, well, <laughs> existing in New York City, it's been here for a long time um, through Montefiore Hospital okay. in the Bronx. Um, and so what we have done through our contract with Montefiore is to actually take Gabby to scale. And that's um, been, how long has that been? Um, over the last year. A lot, yes. Okay, last yes. year. Okay. Um, okay, sorry to keep you guys further. I, I, a couple more questions. Um, the, in looking at the data provided um, by ACS, if you were to go through each individual um, uh, evidence-based program, um, the, the average length of service varies pretty significantly. And I, 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 I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. So, you know, there are uh, some programs that, you know, have a, an average of multi-systemic therapy for child abuse and neglect, 3.7 months is your average length. And then, you know, Parent-child psychotherapy is 7.6, um, and then uh, you know, and then general preventive is is, is 9.7, and and special medical is 23.1. So, obviously, huge, huge range. Why is that? And then for those that are discharged after only a couple of months, what's the aftercare look like? So, what's the follow-up look like, and and uh, how do we ensure that? Families are able to receive services after they've been after the case is closed, basically. Sure. 
Um, so just to address the length of service um, question that you have, uh, that you asked, so each of the models um, determine what their, and research has shown what the length of service um, should be for a family that engage and complete uh, the service intervention. Um, and so the evidence-based models, one of the reasons why we invested in them is because the evidence showed that they um, you know, have success at working short-term with families and getting them on that path to stability. Um, so each model has their own uh, length of service um, determination. With regard to the special medical program that we have, um, the special medical model actually works with families where there is chronic um, health concerns uh, as well as um, developmental disabilities. And so those services tend to um, obviously take a longer time uh, wrapping services around the families that will meet those, those needs. And as we know, those um, issues tend to be, uh, you know, they're not easily eradicated, if at all. Um, and one of the things that we also try to work through is getting the families off ramps to engage in services such as OPWDD, getting their eligibility, um, you know, in, in terms of being eligible and getting them transferred to the services that they need uh, long term. And then uh, types of aftercare uh, after, after the length of services mm -hmm. uh, is discontinued? Yes. So all families uh, that engage in prevention services have the ability to return to uh, the programs whenever they feel that they need um, to touch bases with them. So uh, all prevention programs, no matter what, whether they are evidence-based or they are uh, general prevention or FTR, uh, the families at, at discharge or once we end prevention services know that they can return. Uh, part of the aftercare of those services uh, is also addressed while the family is receiving services. So part of the assessment is once this service intervention ends, what might the family need to continue with in their community? And so wrapping, that, wrapping services around them that will continue with uh, community-based organizations, for example, helping the families to know what services are there that they might want to participate in. Um, and of course, you know, our FECs uh, is where we actually see an opportunity for families to be able to continue those uh, in community um, sources, resources. Um, okay, and then just moving over to data, there was this report that um, was put out last year, so this was in 2017, but is still relevant. It's, um, uh, it's called Data Before Dollars. Um, it's the Citizens Budget Commission. Um, and and um, in, in, it's a short report, it's only four pages four or five pages, um, but it, it speaks to the need for uh, some more transparency about metrics and how we're measuring, because, you know, and, and starting off with saying, look, we have, um, we've had a, you know, a, a, over the last 15 years, enormous investment in preventive services. Um, it's, it's correlated with a decrease in in foster enrollment may not, your correlation doesn't equal causation, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily um, determined, you know, de one determines the other, um, but it's hard from, from where they sit to be able to glean how effective preventive services are based on the publicly available data. And um, and so that's, you know, their conclusion, New York City has more than doubled its investment in preventive services from $123 million in fiscal 2000 to 256 in fiscal 17, and obviously over 300 now. Um, uh, these investments are meant to improve outcomes for family and prevent foster care and child, child maltreatment, critically important policy goals. Additional investments in these services could be contingent on a more thorough understanding of whether these services are achieving the desired outcomes. ACS's performance should be evaluated consistently using data and metrics rather than in response to headline, headlines of tragic cases that focus the public 
focus the public, that focus the public's attention. Yeah. And obviously, I know that you agree with that. We agree. <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to know how are we looking at data and metrics when it comes to, I mean, how are we evaluating it? Are we evalu and, and, and is there a you know, kind of a qualitative approach to that? So, um, you know, outcomes, what, what kind of outcomes are we looking at when we, yeah. when we evaluate? Well, we do, do agree, obviously, not just that there should be a more holistic look at our success, but also that outcomes are ultimately what we're concerned about. So, you know, we're proud of how many families we're serving, we're proud of the, the services they're receiving, but the real question is, uh, you know, is it helping families be more stable, is it keeping kids more safe? Um, and we do have uh, quantitative data, and I'll speak to it, we're happy to share the actual numbers with the council, and we actually have, have shared them publicly as well. Um, and then we do very um, intensive qualitative work with the providers through our quality assurance system, which Dr. Martin can talk about. But um, in terms of really objective outcomes, um, a couple of things that we're proud of, and as I say, I'll, I'll get you the exact numbers, but I'll give the general sense that I have, and that is we have looked at the likelihood that a family that has successfully completed preventive services will return with another indicated investigation on an abuse or neglect report within six months versus a family that has not successfully completed services. And uh, our data show that the likelihood of another indicated investigation within six months drops by 80% if the family, and I, I, I'm not going to remember the exact number, I think it's something like it's a likelihood of one in 38 as opposed to one in seven families who have successfully, did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. That okay. difference, is, that, is there a difference between general and evidence-based? Uh, that's across the entire portfolio. I don't know if we've broken it down. We probably could do that, that would but be I'm, interesting not, to I'm know. not sure that we have. So um, that, it, to us, is a very strong indicator that uh, preventive services are achieving the, the core goal of keeping children safe and out of future involvement with the child welfare system. The other thing is, with regard to the decline in the foster care census, uh, not only has it dropped, but one thing that we looked at that is, I, I think is illustrative is to compare the decline in the foster care caseload in New York City versus the rest of New York State. New York State's foster care caseload as a whole has declined over the last six, eight years, basically through this decade. But it's declined faster, significantly faster in New York City than it has in the rest of the state. And we operate under exactly the same rules about when to do a removal, when to indicate a case. Everything is the same frankly, except the most significant difference is the investment we've made in preventive services. So again, that's correlation, not causation, but we also think that's a strong indication that the investment in preventive services as an alternative to removal into foster care has made a difference in terms of a much faster decline in foster care census in New York City than elsewhere in New York State. So those are sort of quantitative outcome metrics, but as I say, our our uh, quality assurance program, which we call uh, CoQI, -Co involves very detailed work with the um, agencies on a regular basis and sharing and review of data with them on their performance on a very regular basis as well. And there's a scorecard. Yes. That, now, that's, that's not publicly facing, right? It is not currently publicly facing. That's correct. Is, is, there a, is that under consideration? Uh, Being it, that a lot of these are same agencies that are doing <laughs> foster care, and that was one of the outcomes of the DOI. So, uh, because as you know, uh, in response to uh, a recommendation from the Department of Investigation a couple of weeks ago, we have decided to make the scorecards publicly available for foster care agencies. Um, we're now considering whether we should do the same thing with regard to preventive services. I haven't made a determination yet. Right. It's complicated, right? I mean, it, and, um, you know, and you, but I think that having something that is, something that is understandable I mean, I think honestly, for, for, for somebody that's engaging with a, with a preventive service agency, it, it, it's, it's helpful to know are these, you know, how well performing these agencies are, uh, you know, compared to their peers. Yep. Again, it's, I, I, I understand the limitations of, of, of kind of comparing one organization to another and, you know, the comparing apples to oranges in some instances, so I, I can understand the, the challenges with that. But I yeah. think having, in terms of transparency, I mean, transparency is always good, I think, for all parties. Yeah, no, we understand that, and, and that's something that we're looking at. We, we are certainly interested in um, consumer assessment of the quality of our services, and we will be doing uh, a survey to that effect, as yes. you know. Yes, how do we do that? <laughs> how do we get feedback from, like, is there, is it, the, going back to the kind of the the, maybe the idea of a client bill of rights, 
do, do, is there like an ombudsman that where some like a client can say, you know what, I didn't get the services that I felt like I needed, or I didn't get the, you know, I just didn't get the engagement that I felt like I needed, or I needed furniture and I couldn't get furniture, or you know, I needed help with a case, you know, with with an HRA case and I didn't get help with an HRA case. Is there a, is there a, a number for them to contact, or is there an office, or is there somebody that's kind of like within the preventive overall structure that, that acts as an ombudsman? Well, let me begin to say we have an office of advocacy within ACS that fields complaints from uh, clients or anyone else, for that matter, about any ACS service, and then fields it appropriately to the right unit for follow-up. And that's so, a phone number people can call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we do have one across the agency. I don't know if there's one specific and, to. And then preventive. more broadly, how do you? I, what's the structure for getting feedback from clients? Because I think that that would be very helpful to know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a very good question. Um, within the prevention agencies, they certainly can uh, survey their families, uh, both at entry as well as exit. Uh, but what we found is, is that those surveys are not consistent um, you know, across the entire continuum. Uh, one of the things that we're excited about in the project that we um, have with Designing for Opportunities is really helping us to figure out exactly the question that you asked how do we get at that information? Um, when should we get at that information? And then what do we do with it across our continuum? So we're pretty excited to be able to look at that entire pathway of a family from the minute that they're referred to prevention services until their exit. Yeah. And so part of the interviews that they will be doing with families is gonna help us design exactly that. Um, I also think that one of the things that we have been uh, been doing in terms of planning for you know 20, 20, uh, 20 and 2021, which is RFP and our our services, having the family voice really included in that work is so critical to us, and so we're going to be looking at how we do take advantage of that and opportunities. Um, and the survey that the commissioner uh, mentioned, I think that. Um, we are expected to implement that survey in um, 2019, I believe. And so we are beginning to think through how we will go through, um, you know, the survey. And that's a question in the response to uh, the council. Yeah. <laughs> Although something we want to do uh, on our own as well. Okay. And that's, and that's akin to the, to the foster survey that we, were, that we did through legislation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess my, my last question um, is, uh, what's the size of the preventive workforce in New York City? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to, as a gotcha question, it could be, a, it could yeah. be an approximation. We know how many agencies, of course, 54 agencies and about 200 programs. Do we know staff? We may have to get you, we'll get you that, that number. Yeah, we'll get that number. Yeah. Okay, because yeah. I think just in terms of like, of, it would be helpful to know, you know, then how many people are needed to be trained, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and have to go through that, uh, you know, and, and I'm assuming there's the, there's the onboarding, but then is there other refreshers, you know, annually you have to do? With yeah, the well, the, the mandate we put in place, thanks to the funding we got last year, is six days a year. Annually. Annually. Yeah, okay. Six days of annual training. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, that would be helpful to know, and I think just kind of helps us uh, maybe uh, visualize how how much of a challenge that that is really of, of uh, getting that level of training done for that size workforce. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay, one last request is that I would love to come out to one of the family enrichment centers uh, uh, and see the see what's happening there. Very love exciting. to have you. Great. Even so, all, all three if you'd like. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioners uh, for your time. Uh, to your entire staff for preparing for today's hearing, and I uh, look forward uh, to uh, to working with you uh, and engaging with you over the next three years and you know two months to uh, <laughs> to uh, really uh, try to advance um, the level of service as much as we can in the time that we have. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. We'll take a five minute break, and then we have one panel.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we appreciate everyone's patience. And we have uh, one panel uh, of public testimony, so I will call them up. Uh, Jeanette Vega, I know Jeanette has uh, stayed longer than I think that she was originally able to stay. Um, Tesfia Rahman from Coalition for Asian American Children. Oh, and, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jeanette is from RISE. Um, and Arij Abdul Halim, Arab American Family Support Center. And Deidre Cheatham, who is here representing herself, but uh, for full disclosure, is an um, uh, employee staff member in my office at the council. Oh yes, and I'm sorry, we've been joined by Mark Traeger of Brooklyn. Thank you, Mr. Traeger, for attending. Jeanette, if you have to leave, okay. Okay. Sorry. Whoever wants to begin, just make sure that the light is on on the microphone, and uh, and state your name for the record, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jeanette Vega, and I am the training director at Rise. I would like to thank you for the invitation to present to the committee today, in behalf of over 200 parents. Rise was started in 2005 to give parents a voice facing the child welfare system. We train parents to write and speak about their experiences with the child welfare and become advocates for reform. I would like to start with the importance of families in New York City losing the fear of reaching out for help. Families of color that live in low-income communities like the Bronx and Brooklyn have the highest numbers of investigations within the child welfare system. So we feel a high threat of having our children removed and our parenting undermined by authorities who have never lived the same lifestyles as us. Having community resources like the Family and Riches Mentor is a great start. These centers were created with the input of those community members that they serve in my neighborhood. In the Bronx, family know it's there and what they actually offer. I know a mother who was having her lights shut off and she was panicking. She told me that she went to the Bronx location by Hunts Point and that the staff was welcoming, supportive, and very helpful. The mother left with the resolution to her light issue and a prom dress with accessories for her daughter and money management workshops so that she did not repeat the same issue again. These are the things that our communities need, what our families need, not just emotional support, but connections to financial support for families facing an emergency, resources to prevent the child welfare system from removing children from their homes, from their families. A simple peer support group will be beneficial to so many families, Parents sometimes just need to be listened to and hear other stories so that we don't feel alone or isolated in our situations. Families should not fear removal when reaching out for support, but the reality is that parents in New York City rather hide their struggles and have things escalate in their life to a level where there is no room for preventive anymore. An important factor that will play a big role in these preventive agencies is having parent advocates at every preventive agencies to assist. We at RISE, we applaud ACS for beginning these new models and the agencies running them. And we hope, we hope that the outreach, community engagement, and confid the, ah, confidentiality that these centers offer can be expanded to many more preventive sites around the city. It's really important that ACS brings down the numbers of families referred to preventive by CPS. That's almost 80% of families that are being referred. It's also really important that fewer families experience that court supervision that you spoke about. At this point, more families are in court for court order supervision and removals combined than ever before. We do applaud preventive models for high-risk families, but too often investigations are the way that parents get into preventive. Kids will be safer and parents will feel a lot safer going to the doctor or even just sending their kids to school if preventive agencies will do outreach to these places so that families can get resources before a crisis calls CPS to their door. 
we must have we must not have these great preventive agencies that we've spoken about today hidden from parents parents in my neighborhood do not even know that most of these preventive agencies exist many schools and hospitals do not either if preventive agencies would reach out to the schools hospitals and shelters families will be preferred for support rather than be reported whenever possible Lastly, the Mayor's Design Studio has contracted with ACS to look at how to give parents more choice and voice in preventive services, and this is great. Parents at RISE already offered insight into what they see happening in preventive. To be honest, parents talked about how preventive was mandated on them, and it felt to be almost a foster care light. We hope that ACS and the preventive agencies will seek out more parent feedback on service quality. This is important because parents who have been there are telling other parents that this is helpful. Listen to the community we want to serve. Open a door so families are not scared and alone in their everyday struggles. The city and ACS should be a resource for parents. Don't start a relationship with a census of being told that you are an unfit parent. We would like to thank you for listening to a parent's perspective on the importance of preventive and community outreach. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. So just a quick question for you. So you were seeing uh, some progress, um, but you know, overall still, still need, there still needs to be work to be done. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we see at RISE is that parents are scared to reach out for help because the reality is that the stigma in New York City is that ACS is going to remove your child if you don't accept the services that they're requesting you to do or that they recommend. So it feels like a mandate any way you put it. And when most parents are entering preventive, it's either you're not gonna remove my child or I'm gonna enter preventive. So it's not really an option or a choice, it's really a mandate mm -hmm. or like a threat we like to call it because if you don't do A, B, and C, they will remove your children because they'll say it's a safety concern. Mm -hmm. So again, just having parents being able to say, I need help and the city being able to help them without the fear of losing our children is very important for people to get out of the struggles that they're in. And, you, and you've been to the Family Enrichment Center? Yes, I've actually been to the Hunts Point one, and that's when I met um, one of my neighbors, actually. I live in the Bronx myself, so the neighbor went in and was excited because she went in for a Con Edison bill, and they actually referred her to HRA to get the Con Edison bill, and they were also offering prom dresses for her daughter and they wanted to make sure she didn't have the same Con Edison issue again, so they referred her to money management so she could start learning to budget and manage her money a little better, which is great. And you great. see the benefit in expanding to more neighborhoods, more programs. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Whoever wants to go next. So. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arij Abdul Halim. I'm the Senior Director of Preventive Services from the Arab American Family Support Center. So I want to thank you, um, thank uh, you to the New York City Council and the Administration of Children's Services for collaborating and with community-based organizations like the Arab American Family Support Center to improve the lives of our most vulnerable neighbors. I'm honored to be here today to testify on behalf of the marginalized and under-resourced immigrant and refugee families throughout New York City. Together we have come far in providing strong support systems um, and together we will continue to ensure mo the most effective solutions are available to those that are in need. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we have strengthened immigrant and refugee families since 1994 by promoting well-being, preventing violence, getting families ready to learn, work, and succeed and amplifying voices of marginalized populations. We have been strong partners of New York City and ACS through our preventive services program. Our culturally and linguistically competent trauma-informed case managers meet with the families throughout the five boroughs. Although we have an uh, office in Queens and Brooklyn, we still go out to all the five boroughs to prevent and end violence, improve parenting skills, and most importantly, we want to prevent children from being placed into foster care and really being able to um, look at the culture and what services the family really needs. We commit to servicing these families which are at various levels of risk at a high touch point, seeing families from for nine to 12 months and some even longer. Our staff speaks 
16 languages, including Ang uh, Arabic, Bangla, Hindi, Nepali, Pashto, Spanish, Tibetan, and over 30 dialects. The value of this cultural and linguistic competence cannot be overstated. Our city is rich with diversity. As such, we cannot utilize a one-size-fit-all approach to any service. We can only drive real effective and sustainable change when we offer services in a language that makes sense to the clients, when we understand the cultural elements at play, and when the service providers appreciate and respect the trauma our clients face in their home countries, at, in war, um, in the migration journeys, and living in poverty. So we urge you to continue your commitment and to prioritizing and increasing the availability of culturally and linguistically competent trauma-informed services throughout the five boroughs. So the Arab American Family Support Center stands ready to work with you to help the most vulnerable among us thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, and no thanks problem. for the great work uh, no you problem. do. And I'm, I'm very proud to represent uh, two of your locations at the uh, at uh, Brooklyn headquarters on Court Street and uh, Khalil Gibran International Academy. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and I'm the policy coordinator for the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, CACF. Uh, we thank you, the Chair, Council Member Levin, and members of the General Welfare Committee for holding this important hearing on ACS Preventive Services. Since 1986, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families is the nation's only Pan-Asian children and family advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. The Asian Pacific American APA population, over 1.3 million people, comprises over 15% of New York City. Yet the needs of the APA community are often overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. We are constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth, which prevents communities' needs from being acknowledged and understood. This means our communities, as well as the organizations that serve the community, often lack resources to provide critical services for those in need. We work with almost 50 member organizations to identify and speak out on common challenges and needs across the APA community. APAs hail from South, Southeast, East, and Central Asian countries, as well as from Pacific Islands. In New York City, we represent over 40 ethnicities, tens of languages and religions, and a multitude of cultures and immigration experiences. On behalf of the almost 50 Asian-led and Asian-serving community and social service organizations that comprise our membership, I urge the Council to ensure APA and immigrant children and families have access to much needed, culturally competent, and linguistically accessible preventive services. Today, we ask you to encourage the Administration for Children's Services to expand preventive services contracts and various innovative models of prevention, including family enrichment centers, to be able to ser serve the diverse and high-need APA communities of New York City. Currently, there are no family enrichment centers serving the various APA communities across the city. Additionally, there are no preventive services for a large number of APA children and families, apart from Chinese and Arab American communities. Many times we are not accurately counted and our needs remain misunderstood and unaddressed. Currently, despite our growing population, um, APA community organizations receive approximately 1% of city social service contract dollars. And data collection efforts across the city, including city agencies such as ACS, our communities are many times mistaken in our ethnic or language background and our needs are, are regulated to the category other. This lack of accurately collected data and information in the community, coupled with the lack of accessible information and entry points for APA children and families who require resources and services is often erroneously equated to a lack of need or risk within our communities. Currently, there are no cultural competent and language accessible preventive services available for, this, for the multiple APA communities, including those most disenfranchised and struggling across communities such as various Southeast and South Asian groups. APA struggle not only with a lack of culturally competent service provision, but also struggle with the cultural stigma regarding receiving government services. The recent federal proposals and mandates such as changes in public charge serve to alienate and punish immigrants, especially those who are undocumented, that access needed services. This has only increased the amount of misunderstanding and fear among our communities 
regarding accessing city services and driven those who require services to remain in isolation. As reported by many of our APA organizational members, language barriers that still exist within the child welfare system in New York City include a mismatch in interpretation services with requested language slash dialect, lack of quality interpretation and interpreter bias, delays in inter interpretation and poor, sorry, and poor quality translations of written materials. Limited access to culturally competent, linguistically accessible services and child welfare services in other settings make navigating systems impossible for individuals struggling with limited English proficiency. Cultural barriers and lack of knowledge or familiarity with existing systems of care. This should be considered part of the definition of high risk that draws the city's funding and attention for innovative preventive programming. Yet our APA immigrant communities and the community organizations serving them have traditionally been left out of the dialogue in this regard. We would like to acknowledge the recent efforts of ACS to invite in and understand some of our APA community needs in prevention. Our community has been invited to meet regularly with ACS leadership and we have been involved with the strategic process of the Child Welfare 2021 initiative in preparing for the upcoming round of RFPs for preventive and other ACS contracts. We hope to see reflected in the agency's upcoming RFP for preventing services for various issues and priorities discussed. Still, there remains much to be done and multiple families are languishing without enough data and understanding of community needs and without appropriate preventative services. Improving language access and cultural competence within ACS is crucial to APA communities. All services should be linguistically accessible to all access point, phone, mail, website, and in person. City agencies must go beyond simple translation and interpretation services. Sustained oversight is needed to ensure that strategic policies and investments targeted ameliorating the cultural gap between immigrant communities and child welfare systems are implemented. Our recommendations today are as follows. One, encourage ACS to continue its data collection on the diverse and high need APA immigrant communities and to consider and incorporate the various challenges faced by the immigrant communities in the assessment of community risk and need. Under local laws 126 and 127, ACS is named as one of the city agencies to provide a demographic survey regarding ethnicity and languages spoken of people involved in the system and a compilation of the data for review. There is not enough clarity at this point around the ethnic and language backgrounds of the APA fam families already involved in ACS services. Additionally, the most recent New York City language access law, Local Law 30, requires the expansion of translation and interpretation services to include Arabic and Urdu, among other languages. We ask that there be continued oversight on this process, and we ourselves will also be testifying on the implementation of that law tomorrow. Ultimately, better data and consideration of the community's high needs can result in innovations like family enrichment centers and other prevention models to be reached to the APA communities in New York City. Two, um, encourage ACS to focus on APA community needs in the upcoming RFP process for preventive service. APA children and families comprise 15% of the city's population and APA serving preventive agencies have seen a significant increase in demand over their service capacity for in-language preventive services. The community organizations that provide culturally competent and language accessible services that are in contract with ACS are also providing intensive support services to families involved with ACS. Mainstream prevention providers must be held accountable to prioritizing outreach and service to the currently underserved Asian Pacific American ethnicities. For example, there has been a significant increase in the APA population in the Bronx and Staten Island but because of the dearth of Asian-led and Asian-serving CBOs in these boroughs, many clients travel to Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens for child welfare and youth services that, that are culturally comfortable and competent and linguistically accessible. Ultimately, ACS must be able to ensure vital preventive services in neighborhoods that have well-established and newly emerging APA communities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We hope the, that the City Council will continue to be a champion for New York's most vulnerable children and families. Thank you so much for that testimony and I look forward to uh, working with you. Maybe we can set up a meeting in the, in the near future to talk through um, how to try to get these uh, recommendations implemented, but I look forward to also working with uh, our colleagues at ACS to 
to see that uh, these issues are addressed in the upcoming kinds of RFPs and, uh, and the expansion of family enrichment centers, which I think is a broad consensus point needs to be expanded and expanded to more communities. So. Of course, thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Chair Levin, and the thanks for having me at this ACS Preventative Services uh, Family Enrichment Hearing. Um, I'm just gonna give personal testimony of my experience in uh, dealing with ACS and preventative services coming from a former homeless situation. Um, ACS came into my family's life a year ago and um, I was currently homeless in a domestic violence shelter and um, there was an allegation. Um, the process that I encountered dealing with the ACS worker initially was cold. Um, the, I was interrogated and I say interrogation because I was pulled away from my children um, in the shelter in a separate location um, and there with them for two and a half hours specifically focusing on the domestic violence without even knowing what the initial allegation was. Um, they spoke to my children after that, having me separate from the children. Um, the ACS work that came into my um, life at a point where I had no HRA benefits, I was receiving disability um, and we had no means of anything. Um, the shelter wasn't providing anything and we were just stuck. Um, in talking to the um, ACS worker, I, she met with me maybe twice at the shelter in, over the course of, I wanna say, three months. Um, I transitioned out of shelter into my own home eventually, and I still had an ACS case, so it carried over into my own home. Um, my, I had to provide my worker with where I was moving, um, location and things like that. Mind you, I still had nothing, no HRA benefits, no food stamps, no cash assistance, except for the disability, which was about $700, $700 a month. Um, I had no beds, I had no food. My children had bare necessity clothing. We were shifting from some, um, summer to fall, so the only clothes we had were summer clothes. Um, I requested that um, I, I told my ACS worker that I didn't have you know, anything to move in my apartment, and she told me that I needed to talk to shelter staff. Shelter staff coordinated with her and provided me with air beds. Um, I'm, I'm saying this to speak to the volume of lack of caring, and lack of caring starts at the first interaction. Um, ACS and you know, the preventive service team spoke a lot about you know, first steps and how they initially interact with people well, the first interaction I had was horrible and they neglected my family from the beginning. Um, I want to also speak to the fact that my preventative service worker, she's an amazing individual, but she, there was no resources for us. We had no resources for um, therapy, which according to ACS was mandated. Um, we had no, she had no resources for us for therapy, no resources for us for, um, bare necessities, food, clothing. I mean, we had shelter, but that was due hard advocacy and, um, you know, my due diligence. Um, preventative services, in my opinion, is lacking. They are lacking a lot. They are lacking in resources. They are lacking in funding. They are lacking in care and compassion. And again, I can only speak from my point of view in it. Um, the pop-up visits were horrible. I wanted at one point to discontinue my services with preventative care and I was told I could not do that even though I had, I had my kids in therapy and I did everything that I had to do that was required of me. Um, yeah, I don't know what more to say other than Something is wrong and something's got to change with preventative services. Um, there is really no reason that they, ACS can turn a family who has nothing over to the care of another provider and there are no resources and you still leave children with nothing and 
when I say I don't want the care that you guys are offering me because there are no services to be provided except what I'm finding, I'm being told no. I was never giving a bill of rights, like they said. I never got a bill of rights to say when I could terminate services, how, they never connected me with uh, counselors, so I'm calling them out right now because what I heard, it's not true, at least from my perspective. So I just wanted to put that on the record, and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cheatham, um, and thank you for, um, for your courage in speaking before this committee today uh, and for telling your story um, and, um, and for bringing an important perspective um, uh, to this hearing. Thank you. Do you, as a quick follow-up question, do you see um, or do you anticipate that there would be value in having kind of a formalized structure of client feedback um, so that, uh, and that that's in a way that's kind of a, a more formal approach than has existed to date? I mean, they, they do have uh, client feedback, but it's, it's a form and it's pretty much uh, general questions. Uh, it's the same questions they ask you when you get the services, um, but yeah, to answer your question, I do think that there needs to be a way for families to voice their opinion, especially during the process when they need help. You don't know who to call. You're told to call your ACS worker, but then you're transferred from ACS to preventative services, so you're bouncing around. No one at the ACS office knows who you're talking about when you're saying you need to file a complaint because then they think it's automatically ACS. They make it feel like it's two separate entities and they're not working together even though they overturn care to each other. And on something like just the basic, you know, bedding or clothing and things like that, did you feel like that was a, a facilitated experience at all or whether that was an easier experience or was that a, was that, do you see that as a difficult or experience or, or one filled with obstacles? It was difficult. Um, I had to beg you, you have to beg for them. Um, we slept on, I moved in my apartment in October. We slept on an air mattress until January and we got, uh, my daughter got a bed and my son got a crib that broke the next day. Mm -hmm. And I let the ACS worker know the crib was broke. I let the preventative care person know the crib was broke and I was told to call the people that delivered it. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, and um, and you know, as I said at the outset, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you, you do work uh, during your normal business hours uh, on our staff, and um, and so I, I, I've been in our in the, in the office, and so I, I, I look forward to continuing to work with you, um, uh, and and ACS on, on on making sure that reforms that are made are translated from, you know, the commissioner, deputy commissioner, and assistant commissioner level, and that that, that, that has a real impact on case manager and supervisor level uh, in the agencies themselves. So. Thank you. And thank you very much for your testimony. Thanks. Okay. Um, does anyone else wish to testify? Seeing none, at 4.12 p.m., this hearing is adjourned.